Thank you all very much. Uh, I have to say that I'm extremely honored and blessed to be here, not only to give a TEDx talk, but to come here to Columbia and share my passion for space and education and the merging of the two. So I'm sure that you all are here for TEDx talks, and so many of you have seen many TED talks or TEDx talks in the past. And so I'm sure you've seen a lot of different talks focused around leadership. In fact, you just saw one about leadership. Uh, and we also have a term for people who tend to gravitate towards leadership, and we call them natural born leaders. Now, I personally believe that that is a bit of a misnomer. Yes, you can have people who are born that, and, have, uh, and have very good leadership qualities. However, true leaders, the real leaders out there that are pushing forward our boundaries, they're not born, they're created. So I'm here to talk to you about the importance of building leadership qualities in the next generation. It's ultimately up to us as the mentors, the adults, the people with gray hair, and who have experience to recognize these leadership qualities in our students, in our children, and in the next generation in total, and help develop them so that they can ultimately lead us forward into the future. And so the great thing about leadership, in my opinion, is that it doesn't matter who you are, where you are in your career, what you do, uh, and, and what your personal life looks like, you can always be working on your own personal leadership qualities and using those to influence and inspire the next generation. So as, as we heard, I do work at NASA and, uh, and we, do have, uh, we do have a lot of leaders within NASA. We also, uh, we also tend to work within STEAM and that stands for science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. And so that's primarily what I'm going to talk about today is space exploration and STEAM in more in general. But I want you to know that no matter what it is that you do, you don't have to be within STEAM, you don't have to be interested in space research. Everything that I'm going to tell you today is applicable beyond just what STEAM is. So I'm sure some of you are sitting there thinking, okay, he works at NASA, there's you know, there's a lot of nerds that work at NASA. Uh, and I've, evidence number one. Uh, and so what do you need leaders within NASA for? What do you need leaders within STEAM? And, you know, don't all of the, don't all of the NASA types, don't they sit in their labs mixing chemicals together? Or they sit in front of a computer reducing data all day till their heart's content. And the short answer there is yes. Yes, we do that. Uh, we do it a lot. Uh, but the interesting thing is the future of research is interdisciplinary. It's collaborative. And it's filled with technology. There's so much technology rolling around in the future of science and research. It's, it's ridiculous. But if you take a step back and really look at research and how it's funded, it's political. Research is driven by policy, and I would be happy to sit down with each one of you and debate over whether or not that's a good thing, perhaps over Cerveza or, or three. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that currently we live in a world where budgets are shrinking with regards to research and technology and engineering and education, and we're continually being asked to do more with less. And those decisions are really being generated at all levels, from, from my level and down, all the way up to the highest levels of government and industry. And so it's for that exact reason that we need students that are interested in STEAM to also develop these leadership qualities so that ultimately they can go out and influence policy, if not actually becoming the decision makers themselves. So, Question, what is leadership? What does leadership mean to you? You know, some people sit there and think, ah, oh, leadership's or leadership, that's uh, that's someone that's in a position of power. It's a senior management uh, position. It is someone who's been around forever. And so I ask you, do you look back throughout your lives 
And do you, can you think of leaders that have been in those categories or in others that may represent leadership to you? And the question is, were all of them leaders? They may have been in a position of power, but I would probably argue that not all of them, and actually a very small fraction of them, were good leaders, true leaders. And so, and so the question is, what makes a good leader? And I would, it's my own personal opinion, but I would say the first and foremost thing that I look for in a leader and someone that I'm willing to follow is trustworthiness. If you, if you have someone who has honesty, integrity, they have a very strong moral compass, those are all qualities that can really lend itself to creating a strong, trustworthy relationship that you can ultimately build a strong team through, strong team through. Now, of course, that's just one, just one of many, many attributes that people ascribe to, to leaders. Uh, we have, you know, I actually did some research for this talk, believe it or not. I'm, I'm a researcher, so I did some research. And I, I looked online and started writing down all of the different qualities and attributes that people tend to attribute to leaders. And I tell you, I stopped writing after about 60. You know, and, and so the thing is, leadership can come in several different forms. And it's important for us to recognize different forms of leadership and make sure that the students understand that they may not be the person that's up there in front of everyone, you know, doing the rah-rah, getting everyone inspired, but they may be another type of leader. And we want to make sure that they understand they can fill any type of leadership role that they feel comfortable with. And so really when I sit back and look at leaders, you know, uh, like I said, we had over 60 different attributes that I, that I was able to come up with. And, and you've heard them all. You've heard them all. They're creative. They're inspirational. They're able to delegate. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sure you all can think of hundreds more than that. But when it comes down to it, there are several different types of leaders. And each type of leader has its own strengths and weaknesses. And so when I look around, and in my daily life, I do tend to find that there are three different types of leaders. The first type tends to lead from the front. They're very charismatic, they're inspirational, and they get out front and just start running as fast as they can and expect people to follow them. And that's an amazing type of leader. And that's the tip, typical type of leader that you expect when you think of what leadership is. However, there are two other types that I come into contact with. The second one is an enabler. That's what I call the one who likes to get in the middle of a group, set an example that their peers can witness and then emulate and follow. They are very good at group dynamics and they ultimately can, uh, they ultimately can pull a, and push the group along from inside the group itself. And then the third type of leader that I tend to find is the herder, the cat herder for some of us who are trying to herd scientists. Uh, but the herder tends to lead from behind. They actually come along and pick up the pieces where people have fallen behind and bring them back up with the group so that the entire group succeeds together. And each one of those different types of leaders has different qualities. And so it's important to recognize those qualities within the next generation and help foster those, uh, those qualities in those students and make them feel like they are being a positive contributor to any type of group. So now it comes down to what uh, the question is, how do you teach leadership? How do the students recognize what type of leaders they are? And so we have a program that is focused on research, but a large portion of it actually has a strong leadership component. And so, uh, and so I'd like to talk with you a little bit about that. And I give a talk to my students every year, and it has about 25 bullet points uh, that I expect the students to work on over the course of the summer. Now, I'm not going to go through 25 bullet points here, don't worry, uh, so don't fall asleep quite yet. But uh, it, you can boil those 25 points down to just four. And I'd like to share those with you right now. 
And I've ranked them from easiest to hardest. So number one, the easiest one. Teach them everything about everything. It's easy, right? Everything about everything. Don't let the student actually just sit there and rest on their laurels in their chosen field. Push them outside of their comfort zone. If you are working with a biologist, for example, you want the, you want the biologist to learn about geology. You want them to learn about history, business, policy, politics, arts. We want them to understand how all these other fields can impact what they're doing. And so when it comes down to it, it is incredibly important for them to learn everything about everything. Because most good leaders, when they're working and leading a team, they know where their project fits in the bigger picture. They know what it takes to get the entire project done. Every single little aspect. They know where the pitfalls are, what are where the, the budgetary issues. They really want to know how, uh, how politics can shape their long-term strategic decisions. And so when you couple learning everything about everything to what I said before about the future of science and research being interdisciplinary, we really do want the students to be aware of all of these other fields out there that could possibly impact what they're studying. Okay, so that's the first one. Number two, teach them to communicate. I don't think anybody in here would argue with me that communication is absolutely essential in any team environment. However, I would argue that some of the more book smart students out there have difficulties communicating. They are amazing when they're in the lab. They're amazing when they're reading books and gleaning knowledge and, and sitting in front of a computer writing code and making new models. However, when it comes time for them to go out and publish their work, when it comes time for them to go out and relay their work and why it's important to the public so that they can continue to get funding to do the good work, they fall short. And so really, when it comes down to it, we, in our program, we like to tell the students they have to come up with a 30-second elevator speech. 30 seconds. That's all we ask. So if you got on the bottom floor and the president of the United States or the president, the CEO of your company gets on the bottom floor in an elevator at the same time and you ride to the top of the, the building together, at the end of that 30-second ride, you should have been able to convince that president, that CEO, that your research, your ideas are the most important and they should be funded above all else. And get the students in front of people. Make them comfortable talking in front of folks. One of the best bits of advice I ever got was that when you give, when you, whenever you give a t big talk that you could potentially be nervous about, you should wear a Hawaiian shirt. Because nobody could ever be nervous wearing a Hawaiian shirt. So get them comfortable communicating. Because if they can't argue and convince others that their research is the best, no one else is going to do it for them. So even if they have the world's greatest idea, it's going to solve world hunger. And if they can't communicate that idea, it will never happen. Okay. Number three. Again, these are getting harder. Teach them how to fail. And this is actually very difficult to teach. Because most students that tend to go towards leadership, they're type A personalities. They are very successful and they're perfectionists. And chances are they haven't failed in their lives up to this point as, they're, as, they're, as they've been students going through school. And that's fantastic for them. Uh, it's wonderful. But the problem is they are going to fail in their lives and they're going to fail big. And so what we do is we set the students up in a group setting and we give them a project that is ultimately designed to fail. And as they're going through this project, they, we start to stress the system, and we stress it some more, and ultimately we break it. And the reactions from the students are, are astounding to me, and to be honest, and to everyone really. But what happens is, uh, I'm not lying, there are tears, there's yelling, there's compromising, and 
They, and sometimes they cheat in order to succeed. And so, and sometimes you get that from, from all from one student. It's actually pretty fantastic. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I enjoy it a little bit. Um, but it's actually very instructive to the student because ultimately they are going to fail. They're going to suffer stress in their lives. And they need to understand how they react to it and how can they ultimately constructively pick up the pieces, take something from it, and move forward. So teaching them how to fail, number three. Number four, uh, and the hardest one in my opinion, teach them to listen. Scientists are not great listeners. They think their ideas are the best. Their opinions are the only right ones. They'll argue to the ends of the world until they either win the arguments or you pass out. And either way, they feel like they won the argument. And so there you have it. Uh, however, this is like the antithesis of what a true leader does. A true leader listens, period. They, they listen. They listen to their guts. They listen to their conscience. They listen to others. They listen to other points of view so that they ultimately make the correct decisions. And listening goes beyond decision making because we want the leaders to listen to their teams, find out what inspires them, what motivates them, so that we can better assign the different people to the project so that we can have a better chance of succeeding. So listening is actually one of the more important things that uh, you can teach someone. Uh, not just speaking their opinion straight away, but listening to what other people have to say. And so I potentially I lied a little bit. There is a number five, and it is all-encompassing. And that is always be passionate and always have fun. Because if you're not be having fun and you're not passionate, you're wasting your time and you're wasting other people's time. So get out there, find something you're passionate about and having fun with. And so I'd like to finish up here with two quotes about leadership. The first one is by John Maxwell, and uh, these two quotes can sum up leadership better than I ever could. The first one is, a true leader is not great because of their power. They are great because of their ability to empower. And the second one comes from the military. And that one says, if they fear you, they will fight for you. But if they love you, they'll die for you. So I challenge each one of you here to think about what type of leader are you? What type of leadership qualities do you possess? And how can you go and influence not only the next generation, but everybody that you have around you? Thank you very much.